I'm glad to see so many of you are interested in coming to this talk. Um, sometimes when I tell people that death and dying is something that I love to talk about, um, <laughs> they say, well, that's morbid. Why would you want to do that? But to me, um, death is a powerful spiritual teacher. Uh, it's something that takes us right up to the precipice of existence and lets us catch a glimpse of the mystery that brackets our human lives. I'd like to introduce you to this person. Um, her name is Christina. Um, and my training as a doctor happened at a time when the medical profession saw death as something um, to be fought against and resisted as long as possible, sometimes at the great cost um, to the patient. Um, but this little person, Christina, showed me another side of death. And Christina was one of the cutest, sweetest beings that I had ever um, had the, I don't want to say pleasure, but had the opportunity to care for um, in my work as a doctor in a New York City hospital. And um, she was four years old. Um, she was infected with the AIDS virus at birth from her mother, uh, who died shortly after her birth and, and left her in foster care. And um, this was in the early 1980s when we knew very little about AIDS and, and how to treat it. And um, we were losing many children. in those days. Sorry. Can't believe it still <laughs> it makes me almost come to the edge of tears. But at any rate, um, so Christina had to be admitted many times to our pediatric ward for treatment of the infections that her body was incapable of fighting off. And um, as soon as she would start to feel a little, a little bit better, she would be out of bed in her bunny slippers and um, with um, pulling her ivy pole along with her, walking through the wards, just very curious about everything was, that was going on, wanting to see the other children who were there. And, and she was just really the sweetest thing. Um, but um, she, over time, her infections were beginning to take a toll, and finally she developed an infection that we just could not um, get rid of for her, and we realized we were going to lose her. And on the last night of her life, I just wanted to be with her, to honor her for who she had been. And she'd really been a teacher for me. And so I sat with her at her bedside, along with her foster mother, through the night um, as her breathing slowed. And um, finally, the moment came when she took one last in-breath and let it go. And there was not another breath. In, in the, the silence that followed, in the space of um, and not hearing her breathing anymore, um, something happened that I will never forget. Um, it was as if um, in that silence, there, it was not an empty silence. Um, it was, there, was a, there was something present in that silence that filled her room. It was um, as if she were being honored by life, by the universe, I don't know what, but as if she were being honored for the good job that she had done in leading this challenging life and bringing uh, um, this, a, a certain kind of beauty into the world through her life, of shining this radiant light into the world during those four years that touched people. And to me, she was a spiritual teacher. She was a spiritual teacher for me, and I think um, I learned that spiritual teachers can come in many forms from her. 
I want to tell you another story um, about a very different person who unfortunately I don't have a, a picture of. But um, I, towards the end of my career in New York, I um, focused um, completely on working with people at the end of life. I worked with the hospice in my hospital and um, did research did a three-year research project in uh, interviewing people who were living with terminal illness, asking them to tell me as much as they could, what is it like to know that you are living um, at the end of your life, the end of your life is coming, and these are your, your final days in life, and what does that feel like? What, what are you learning something? And so. Um, it was fascinating to invite people into this kind of conversation. Um, people said very fascinating things about what was important to them from this perspective of knowing that life was going to end soon. One of these people was a woman named Ernestine. Ernestine was 78 years old. She um, her father had died at age nine. She said her mother had never liked her. She had never had any friends, and she had never married. She had worked in the mayor's office for decades, and when she turned, as a secretary, and when she turned 60, the day she turned 60, she was laid off with no goodbye party or no thank you. And she just said, you know, Life was, my life was a disappointment. It just, I felt it should have been more than this. And I just didn't understand why. And um, she was very interesting to talk to. She wasn't depressed or angry. She just was more like puzzled. Why, why had this been? When love was handed out, it was as if she had been skipped over and never got her fair share of it. So, um, when she, when the breast cancer she had been treated for years before returned, Adele said, um, good, this is my ticket out. I'm, I'm going to refuse all treatment and just be done with this very disappointing life. She wasn't, she just wasn't bitter, this was just her decision. So um, she came into the hospice unit in my hospital and fell into terminal coma. And I was visiting her there. And um, when I, she'd been in terminal coma for three days when I went to see her at this point. And I walked over to the bed. And the, the head of her bed was, was um, angled upwards so that her head was pretty much the same level of mine. And her head was turned away, and she was, her mouth was slack, hanging open, and she was kind of making these snoring sounds. And as I stood there, just kind of musing on her unique life, and that she was finally going to be free as she had wanted, um, slowly her head turned until she was facing me, and her eyes opened, and her eyes, which at first looked very unfocused, came to a focus and looked straight into mine. And I said, and she said, why Dr. McGregor? And I said, why Adele? Well, how are you doing? <laughs> I can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> and and uh, she said, well, wonderfully. I'm so glad you're here, because I want to tell you, it's everything I ever wanted. It was waiting for me all the time, and I didn't know it. And I said, well, well, Adele, I'm so glad for you. I'm so glad 
you could tell me that. I'm just really happy for you. And she smiled. And then her eyes went glassy and lost their focus on me. And her head sort of drifted back away, and her jaw went slack. And she went back into her terminal coma. Now, people, terminal coma is a term used for people who are in irreversible coma. They don't come out of terminal coma to say goodbye or hello. or <laughs> they, they stay in terminal coma and they die. So this is very unusual. But at any rate, Adele died a couple of days later. And, um, but I, I just will never forget her um, and her, the message that she was very pleased to be able to, to give. And it's a message that I, I really like telling her story because I like to pass on that message that there is uh, mystery in life and um, something wonderful may be waiting for every one of us. I feel that each person's story as they come to the end of life is, is unique, just as each person's life is unique. And there's always more to be learned if we look closely. And so um, I wrote this book, which is in the bookstore, um, called In Awe of Being Human, A Doctor's Stories from the Edge of Life and Death. And in it, I've <laughs> gathered all the strands of the lives that I've been honored to be a little part of over um, the decades and um, put them in this book as a way of kind of honoring and trying to capture some of the human condition, some of what it means to be human. Um, and I, I feel that telling stories, stories of real people, is one of the best ways I know of, of doing that and sharing it with others. So um, that's all I have to say. If anybody has a question. I, I was wondering, um, when I went to university, I had a um, teacher. She was also working in hospitals with children. She was a chapel. And she told me a story about a girl, that this girl, she knew that she was dying and her family she wouldn't accept that, of course they wanted to have her again. And then came to a point where she, in the hospital, they couldn't do anything for her anymore. And um, one time she told her parents, I want to go home. And they took her home to die at home, because the physician said it's, it's okay. And then she was home and she said, I want to go home. And then they realized that she wanted to go home. So I'm wondering if there's children bringing an, another dimension into this topic, death and passing. So mm -hmm. passing. It was what I said was very much what you just said. That, um, I, I, working with children and, and later with adults, but in the years that I worked with children, I felt that children um, at least those who were of an age where they really could relate. I mean, I saw in, we had infants dying of AIDS back then, and um, many of them. But, um, but the older children, three, four, five, um, I felt that they had a sense that they were leaving. And um, uh, sometimes they might say something about that to their parents say goodbye in a way, in some way that their parents felt that's what they were saying. Um, and it didn't surprise me when that happened. It just felt very real. My father, when he was dying from his heart surgery, um, first of all, he died before his heart surgery. He was really afraid of his surgery prior to him dying mm -hmm. before they revived him. But afterwards, he totally changed his demeanor. It was mm -hmm. like he had a knowing and then after his surgery, things did not go well. It was about three weeks before he passed. But I remember him shaking his head, no, he wasn't going to be okay. He couldn't talk to us because of his airway. Um, and then I remember just before he slipped into coma, the look in his eyes. Uh, just, it was like a baby's eyes of pure love. 
just wondering, and we all noticed it. Mm -hmm. He just looked at you as adoringly. Have you seen that look? Yes, I think that's something that happens, that, that the ego, the, the sense of identity that we all accumulate over our lives, um, can be, can, people can sh shed that at the end. They may not. Some people just can remain stubborn and bitter and whatever right up to the end. But, but for some people there can be a dismantling or, or a, a dwindling of the, the presence of some of the edges of their personality and um, they can soften and even really become like a child or even an infant. Yeah, That's, it's very interesting and this is why I've always loved death because it had so many, or so many interesting facets of it. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask you about the empathic near-death experience. I came across Raymond Moody's latest book where he speaks about those who are with the dying one sharing their experience, family and friends, and many physicians also, but many were too hesitant to speak about it openly in the medical profession. Yes, thank you. Wonderful question. I've talked with many family members of people who have died and um, many, definitely not all, but many said that they felt they were traveling with their loved one and could feel how their loved one was moving away and they could travel with them a bit on that path, um, but only partially and then they could feel their loved one moving away to where they could no longer um, feel that they were in touch with them. And I, in fact, that's one of the reasons I loved being around people who are dying, children or adults, because it's as if a certain veil is pulled aside and you can see, you can catch a glimpse of eternity, the, the mystery that it really surrounds us, as I said in the beginning of my talk. Yeah, it's really precious. Hmm. Thank you for coming, everybody. <laughs>